Hi everyone, I'm Alfred. Welcome back to the 36 Lessons of Avak. We did one third of them last time. We will do another third of them here. Sermon 13. These were the days of Resdania, when Chimer and Dwemer lived under the wise and benevolent rule of the Almsivi and their champion the Hortator, when the gods of Veloth would retreat unto their own to mold the cosmos and other matters, the Hortator times would become confused. Vivek would always be there to advise him, and this is the second of the three lessons of ruling kings. The secret syllable of royalty is this. You must learn this elsewhere. The temporal myth is man. The magical cross is an integration of the worth of mortals at the expense of their spirits. Surround it with a triangle, and you begin to see the triune house. It becomes divided into corners, which are ruled by our brethren. The four corners, Bal, Dagon, Malak, Sheog. Rotate the triangle, and you pierce the heart of the beginning place, the foul eye, the testament of the irrefutable for a span. Above them all is the horizon where only one stands, though no one stands there yet. It is proof of the new and the promise of the wise. Unfold the whole, and what you have is a star, which is not my domain, but not entirely outside my judgment. The grand design takes flight. It is transformed not only into a star, but into a hornet. The center cannot hold. It becomes devoid of lines and points. It becomes devoid of anything, and so becomes a receptacle. There is its usefulness at the end. This is its promise. The sword is the cross, and Alm Sivi is the triune house around it. If there is to be an end, I must be removed. The ruling king must know this, and I will test him. I will murder him time and again until he knows this. I am the, f the defender of the last and the last. To remove me is to refill the heart that lay dormant at the center that cannot hold. I am the sword. I am the star. Set the mechanism that allows the transformation of the world. Ours is the duty to keep the compromise from being filled with Black Sea. The Sharmat sleeps at the center. He cannot bear to see it removed, the world of reference. This is the folly of the false dreamer, the amnesia of dream or its power in its circumvention. This is the weaker magic and it is barbed in venom. This is why I say the secret to swords is the mercy seat. It is my throne. I am become the voice of Alm Sivi. The world will know me more than my sister and brother. I'm the psychopomp. I'm the killer of the weeds of Veloth. Veloth is a center that cannot hold. I am is the pilot. Set is the ending. I am the enigma that must be removed. These are why my words are armed to the teeth. The ruling king is to stand against me and then before me. He is to learn from my punishment. I will mark him to know. He is to come as male or female. I am the form he must acquire, because a ruling king that sees in another his equivalent rules nothing. This is what was said to the Hortator when Vivek was not whole. The ending of the words is Alm Sivi. The first part of this is obviously a lie. The Dwemer had to be extinguished first before Vivek and the rest could take control and become gods. As a result, Alm Sivi never could have ruled the Dwemer. However, again, Vivek may have just changed the past. The Four Corners, Bal, Dagon, Malak, and Sheog, are Sheogorath, Malakath, Merun's Dagon, and Molagbal. The Four Corners being the Four Corners of the House of Troubles, a specific part of the chaotic side of the Daedra. It's just the most, these are the four most chaotic guys. The Triune House are just, that's the name for the Tribunal. And surrounded with a triangle is, there's three of them, and that is a shape with three sides. Um, let me see what else here. Vivek saying, I will murder him time and again until he knows this, is a reference to how Vivek probably killed Nerevar. There is a piece of art by Michael Kirkbride. It's excellent. Um, and it depicts Vivek stabbing Morrowind. No, Morrowind. It depicts Vivek stabbing Nerevar in the back with his spear. Um, Sothasil flays the face from, flays the skin from his face, and Almalexia cuts his feet off, I believe. Um, but Vivek is the one that pierces his chest, and Dagoth Orr is nearby as well. Um, and it's possible that Vivek just killed. Nerevar 
to start a reincarnation cycle and then did it again and again and again. Say your words. If things happen in Morrowind because Vivek wills it, then the death of the Nero Reverines would be because Vivek wanted it to happen. As to why is unclear, but... To remove me is to refill the heart that lay dormant at the center that cannot hold. Red Mountain is unstable by its nature as a volcano. It is as a center that cannot hold. And then there is one thing that I've only just realized is ambiguous by my reading of it. I am the sword, I am the star, set the mechanism that allows the transformation for the world. He's saying, I am, letter I, A-M, the word am, the sword. I am the star, A-Y-E-M, as in Amalexia's dead name. And then set is again the name of Sothasil prior to, you know, Apotheosis. The Charmat is one of the titles of Dagoth Ur. And they refer to him as the False Dreamer as well. The Black Sea is what they refer to Oblivion as. And then Vivek says, I will mark him to know. He is to come as male or female. The Nereverine can be whatever race or gender you prefer. And Vivek saying that he will mark him, I'm not sure what that implies. Perhaps it might even be that Vivek is the one who started the prophecy of the Nereverine. But it's very unclear. The secret syllable of royalty is this, you must learn this elsewhere, is written literally. Elsewhere is just in... Um, Sermon 12, which, go watch the last video if you haven't caught up. But, from Sermon 12, the quote is, With these magic words, the king of rape added another, Chim, which is the secret syllable of loyalty. And Chim is a state of being or state of mind, wherein someone is able to think further. Um... And it's part of what grants Vivek his godlike powers. It's not just that he's stolen divinity. Through his own thinkings and teachings and learnings, he has thought himself into a new state of being. Um, and it's part of why he's so powerful and dangerous. Not only has he artificially absorbed a lot of divine power, but he has also physically taken in enough learning that he has become something else just through his own power. Sermon 14 is up next, and it follows directly after Sermon 12, which makes 13 very confusing, because it does not follow after 12, but the one following it does. So, Sermon 14. Vivek lay with Molag Ball for 80 days and 8, though headless. In that time, the prince placed the warrior poet's feet back and filled him with the blood of Daedra. In this way, Vivek's giant form remained forever harmless to good earth. The pomegranate banquet brought many spirits back from the dead, so the sons of daughter of the Union had much to eat besides fruit. The Duke of Stamps Scamps came while the banquet was underway, and Vivek looked on the seven penates with anger. The King of Rape had become necessary, and therefore troubled for the rest of time. His legions and Kuatas fell into open war, but the children of Molag Ball and Vivek were too elaborate in power and form. The Duke of Scamps therefore became a lesser thing, as did all of his own children. Molag Ball said to them, You are the sons of liars, dogs, and wolf-headed women, and they have been useless to summon ever since. The Holy One returned at last, Vek, golden with wisdom. His head found its body had been tenderly used. He mentioned this to Molag Ball, who told him he should thank the barons of move like this. For I have yet to learn how to refine my rapture. My love is accidentally shaped like a spear. So, Vivek, who had a grain of I am's mercy, set to teach Bolag Maul in the ways of belly magic. They took out their spears and compared them. Vivek bit new words onto the king of rape so that it might give more ruin to the uninitiated. This has since become a forbidden ritual, though people still practice in secret. Here is why. The Velothi and monsters and demons that were watching all took out their own spears. There was much biting and the earth became wet, and this was the last, last laugh of Molag Ball. Watch as the earth shall crack, heavy with so much power that it should have been forever unalike. 
than that a stretch of badlands had been the site of marriage fragmented and through fire, and a race that is no more, but that was terrible at the time to behold came forth. Born of the biters, that is all they did, and they ran amok across the lands of Veloth and even to the shores of Red Mountain. But Vivek made of his spear a more terrible thing from a secret he had bitten off from the King of Rape, and so he sent Molag Bol tumbling into the crack of the biters and swore forever he would not deem the king beautiful ever again. Vivek wept as he slew all of those around him with a terrible spear. He named it Muatra, which is a milk taker, and even the Khmeri mystics knew his fury. Anyone struck by Vivek at this time turned barren and withered into bone shapes. The path of bones became a sentence for the stars to read, and the heavens have never known children since. Vivek hunted down the biters one by one, and all their progeny, and killed them by means of the nine apertures, and the wise still hide theirs from Muatra. The ending of the words is Almsivi. Vivek and Molag Ball may or may not have had sex for 88 days. At this time, Vivek had still been decapitated. Um, but since he was a god, he didn't really mind that much. And as mentioned in 12, that feast is still going on. Mentioned all the way back in 7, the Duke of Scamps is here. Um, and he showed up to conquer Morrowind to help Molag Ball do it, in fact. But Molag Ball didn't care anymore. Um, and so the Duke of Scamps and Molag Ball fought. The Duke of Scamps therefore became a lesser thing, as did his own children. Um, this is a just so story. In the same way that like, oh, the possum originally had a bushy tail, and then it was pulled out and made really long and flabby. Um, this is a just so story about how Scamps are the weakest kind of Daedra. Molag Ball annihilated them, and now they're all weak and decrepit. Hello, son. My cat's meowing. The Holy One returned at last to Vec, golden with wisdom. It's unclear what this means exactly. I think the case is... Um... Vivek grew his head back or found it again. And in the same way... Found his head as in... Remembered himself, remembered his learnings and teachings. Um... They pulled out their spears and compared them. This may or may not be a literal dick measuring contest. My love is accidentally shaped like a spear. May be a reference to how Molag Ball hurts people during sex. Um, belly magic may just be really good sex. Vivek bit new words might be that he literally carved, like he performed oral sex on Molag Ball and bit him. That's unclear. That appears to have happened a lot. A race that is no more but was terrible at the time to uphold came forth. That may be the Dwemer. That may be a race of Daedra we don't know about. Uh, Vivek made of his spear a more terrible thing from a secret he had bitten off from the King of Rape. Muatra is Vivek's spear, and it's well known. It, at one point, was mentioned to be made of bones, and may or may not have also been a fishing implement. Um as Vivek's mother was a Necheman's wife. Um, so it may have been a fishing spear, it may have been made of bones. Both of those may have been true. Muatra means um, milk taker. And considering that I don't know that milk finger doesn't not mean nipple or penis, milk taker might be a reference to how Vivek has uh, hermaphroditism is a hermaphrodite, and may or may not have both types of genitalia. This is also important. Muatra is just an anagram for trauma. The letters are rearranged. Anyway, as it is already non-canon that Daedra can even have children, it's really unclear as to what has been happening here. Daedra are creatures of destruction, or at least not creatures of creation. Their nature as Daedra means that they did not take part in creating the universe. And this is why they have no place in it. Um, and that means that they cannot create. They have no desire to do so. Particularly Molag Ball. Molag Ball cannot have children and has no mention of it. And the children of Molag Ball is just a epithet for vampires. Because um, Molag Ball created vampires 
by forcing himself on a woman and making her into a thing that has to force herself on others just to feed and live. Because Molag Ball is possibly the worst, most evil, vile character in The Elder Scrolls. And just so it's clear, it's not like that's a title with a lot of contention for it. Maybe Merun's Dagon and some interpretations of Mana Marco are the only other ones in running for the title. And still, Molag Ball is so base and vile in his aggressions that... Because it's not like Molag Ball often has a lot of plans going with it. He's just a giant divine rapist. Anyway, again... It is unclear as to what the children of Vivek and Molag Ball even are, and we will never find out because Vivek hunted them all down, and considering he stabbed them with Muatra, which may or may not be his penis, he may have intercoursed them to death, but I really don't know. Uh, and it may be literal, and he may have stabbed them. In Vivek City, the city of Vivek, Underneath the Ministry of Truth, the large floating meteor, it's actually a small moon, but underneath that is the temple, like large temple district, and one can see large statues of the warrior poet Vivek, and he's carrying Muatra, he's carrying the spear. In um, the art, my friend drew me, of Mine the Reverie, he's in fact sitting in front of one of those statues wearing chitin armor, drinking Sujama in Vivek City. That's where the art is. Um, but yes, that's how we know what Muatra is and looks like. It also appears to have been the spear that he stabbed Narabar with. Sermon 15. These were the days of Resdania, when Chimer and Dwemer lived under the wise and benevolent rule of the Almsivi and their champion, the Hortator. When the gods of the Veloth would retreat to their own to mold the cosmos and other matters, the Hortator would become confused. Vivek would always be there to advise him, and this is the third of three lessons of ruling kings. The ruling king will remove me, his maker. This is the way of all children. His greatest enemy is the Sharmat, who is the false dreamer. You or he is the shingle, Hortator. Beware the wrong walking path and the crime of benevolence, and behold him by his words. I am the Sharmat. I am older than music. What I bring is light. What I bring is a star. What I bring is an ancient sea. When you sleep, you see me dancing at the core. It is not a blight. It is my house. I put a star into the world's mouth to murder it. Tear down the pylons my blind fish, swim in the new phlogistion, tear down the pylons, my death moons, sing and burn and orbit me. I am older than music, what I bring is light, what I bring is a star, what I bring is an ancient sea. You alone, though you come again and again, can unmake him. Whether I allow it is within my wisdom. Go unarmed into his den with these rules of power, with these words of power. I, Gartak Padome, Kim al Adun. Or do not. The temporal myth is man. Reach heaven by violence. This magic I give to you. The world you will rule is only an intermittent hope, and you must be the letter written in that certainty. The ending of the word is Almsivi. So, we can see now that whenever a chapter is about Vivek talking to the Hortator, talking to Nerevar, it begins, these were the days of Resdania, yada, yada, yada. The ruling king will remove me, his maker. The ruling king may or may not be the player character or the Nereverine himself. I say himself because mine is a male, but again, it can be, uh, that soul can inhabit anyone. Um... The removal of Vivek appears to be a reference to how, through the plot of Morrowind, Vivek's source of divinity is cut off and destroyed. You or he is the shingle. A shingle is presumably a piece of the roof and something that keeps the bad weather out. This is another reference to how Dagoth or and Nereverine are kind of two sides of the same coin. I don't know which one of you is the theorist and which one is the terrorist, 
and I also don't know which one is the more dangerous. This is something mentioned in an earlier sermon. Beholden by his words is just a reference to how you will be able to very clearly tell Dagoth Ur is for real, because he will say these things. I am the Sharmat. This is just his title. I am older than music. This is very unclear. Music has always been a part of the Elder Scrolls, but the Mythopoeic forces that Dagoth Ur draws upon through the middle of Red Mountain is something that does predate most of men and most of Myr, and in fact, may predate music, in fact. This might be what he means by it. What I bring is light, what I bring is a star, what I bring is an ancient sea. Earlier, Oblivion, the hell dimension, is referred to as a black sea. And so, space may be, you know, poetically referred to as a sea here. What I bring as an ancient sea is how Dagoth Ur wants to remake the world. Take it back to its primordial state and remake it. Um, I mentioned that the original gods made a canvas. And then the Aedra painted on the canvas. Real, strong and powerful gods like Talos put more paint on the canvas. Whereas weaker gods like Vivek just changed the paint that was already there. What Dagoth Ur is doing is he is burning holes in the canvas. Potentially to make his own, but as to what will actually happen if he succeeds is unclear, because the canon ending is that that doesn't happen. But this might be what he means by what I bring is an ancient sea. He brings mythopoeic forces to remake the universe in a way that no god has ever done since the first one. When you sleep, you see me is a reference to how Vivek's um, people are being turned into Dagoth slaves, and they are referred to as sleepers and dreamers. And what's more, the player character in Morrowind has dreams of Dagoth, or at the time they don't know that it is him, but there are only so many great golden beings and huge masks. We're pretty sure it's Dagoth, or. It is not a blight, it is my house. This is a reference to the sickness called the blight, or the divine disease, but it's properly named Corpus. It's a disease created by Dagoth Or to infect people with his mind and to turn them into his slaves. It is not a blight, it is my house. This is a reference to how he does not see it as a disease. He just sees it as a way to add people to his house. Considering that Dagoth Ur is named that because he is the, you know, main member of House Dagoth. In the same way that Nerevar... Nerevar's real name is Indoril Nerevar, and he's of House Indoril. Dagoth's birth name was born Vorin Dagoth, and he's of House Dagoth. The Blight is just a way to create more members of his house. I put a star into the world's mouth to murder it. Dagoth Ur is building something. And some argue that the towers may or may not be parts of a large divine body, either the body of the creator or the body of Lorcan. Um, this is a minor spoiler, but the Red Mountain does contain the heart of Lorcan, and that is a literal statement. And some argue that the Throat of the World in Skyrim is a tower as well, and it may literally be Lorcan's throat, Lorcan's mouth. This is why the best speaking and use of the voice, the Thum, is accomplished at the peak. And also why there's a dragon break there, much like the dragon break that occurred at Red Mountain, or at Numidium. Numidium is the Brass Tower. Red Mountain is the Red Tower. And I don't know what the Third of the World's color is. Um, yes. My blind fish swim in the new Phlogistion. Phlogistion is an outdated scientific term, as it happens. Um... Back in the day, people were not clear on what fire was. And so they adopted a new... This one scientist created a new term to describe the particle that must 
compose fire. In the same way that light is not, you know, a beam of light, it is actually a bunch of m nanoscopic quantum particles called photons. He argued that fire must be the same thing, and it's actually comprised of quantum particles called phlogistions. This is the origin of that ray gun that the Pyro has in Team Fortress 2 called the Phlogistonator. It's why it also doesn't generate pure fire, it generates pure phlogistions. I don't think phlogistions exist, but his theory makes sense. We know that light is caused by photons. We're pretty sure that gravity has its own particle called a graviton. Um, some people argue that that's how magnets work. I don't really think that's the case, but if somebody cracks some quantum science open and shows me that that, that is the case, I will accept it. I don't think phlogistions exist. However, Dagoth Ur does not exactly have a proper grasp on the world here. This is why he uses such an outdated scientific term. Even though it's not clear that that type of physics exists in the Elder Scrolls, but on the other hand, the Dwemer are very, very advanced. My deaf moon sing and burn me and orbit me. It's unclear as to what that is, but there are two moons above uh, Nern, above the planet. And much like the thing at the heart of Red Mountain, they are pieces of Lorcan, flesh divinity. They're parts of his body. They may be deaf because they physically cannot hear them, and he cannot talk to them. Vivek then says to the Hortator, You alone, though you come again and again, can unmake him. So, not only will you be reborn over and over, but in fact, if you die, you can reload a save. That's what you can do as the Nerebarine. And that is what is what makes the Nereverine so powerful. Their reincarnation and the fact that they can reload a save if they die means that it is irrelevant how many times they fail. They only have to succeed once, much like the undead from Dark Souls. Their failure is not that big of a deal because their failure is temporary, but their success will last forever. Whether I allow it is within my wisdom. This is Vivek attempting to influence the minds of the people and say, hey, I know the Nereverine is really powerful, but I'm the only one that can really, you know, make, make it happen. Go unarmed into his den with these words of power. Um, the words of power are partially irrelevant. They're the same words mentioned earlier. <clears throat> but going unarmed into his den is... Not terrible advice. Dagoth Ur's type of power means that he is unkillable, and he says this himself. What? I'm a god. How could you kill a god? What a fool you are. Going unarmed into Dagoth Ur's den is irrelevant, really. You cannot kill Dagoth Ur no matter what weapons you have. Sermon 16. The Hortator wandered through the morning hold, wrestling with the lessons he had learned. They were slippery in his mind. He could not always keep the word straight and knew that this was a danger. He wanted to find Vivek, a lord and master, glory of the image of Veloth, and found him in all places at the Temple of False Thinking. There, clockwork shears were taking off Vivek's hair. A beggar king had brought his loom and was making of the hair an incomplete map of adulthood and death. Nerevar said, Why are you doing this, my lord? Vivek said to make room for the fire. And the Hortator could see that Vivek was out of sorts, though not because of the impending new power to come. The golden warrior poet had been exercising his water face as well, learned from the drugs before he was born. Nerevar said, is this to keep you from the fire? Vivek said, it is so I may see with truth, and my place here at the altar of Padome in the house of false thinking. Serve so that I may see beyond my own secrets. The water face cannot lie. It comes from the ocean, which is too busy to think, much less lie. Moving water resembles truth by its trembling. Nerevar said, I am afraid to become slipshod in my thinking. Vivek said, reach heaven by violence then. So, to quiet his mind, the Hortator chose from the fight racks an axe. He named it and moved on to the first note. 
There, Nerevar was greeted by the Parliament of Craters, who knew him by title and resented his presence, for he was to be a ruling king of Earth, and this was the Lunar Realm. They shifted around him in a pattern of entrapment. The moon does not recognize crowns or scepters, they said, nor the representatives of kingdoms below, lion or serpent or mathematician. We are the graves of those who have, that have migrated and become ancient countries. We seek no queens or thrones. Your appearance is decidedly solar, which is to say, a library of stolen ideas. We are neither tear nor sorrow. Our revolution succeeded in the manner that it is written. You are the hortator, and unwelcome here. And so Nerevar carved at the grave ghosts until he was out of breath, and their parliament could make no new laws. He said, I am not of the slaves that perish. Of the members of parliament, only a few survived the Hortator's attack. A surviving crater said, appropriation is nothing new. Everything happens of itself. This motif is by no means absurd associated with hero myths. You have not acted with the creative impulse. You fall below the weight of destiny. We are, not, we are graves, but not coffins. Know the difference. You have only dug more and supplied no ghosts to reside within. Central to your claim is the predominance of frail events. To be judged by the earth is to sit on a throne of wonder why. Damage us more, and you will find naught but the absence of our dead. The ending of the words is Omsivi. In Sermon 16, Nerevar is unsure about his path forward. And Vivek says, reach heaven by violence then. Which is a really cool thing to say, but also truly a real fact of the matter. If you're very unsure on where to go in Morrowind, just find somebody to kill. That's pretty much the way to solve a whole lot of quests. Just kill someone. Nerevar's axe is only mentioned in a few places, and in fact, he gets rid of it later, much like I did. Um, the first moon appears to be Masser, one of the actual moons. As to how he got there, I am unsure. Um, and as to what he's even doing there, I am also unsure. Vivek getting his hair cut is why Vivek is bald in all of his depictions. But what's more, to make room for the fire is normally a literal statement. Vivek does not have hair, but has a large plume of flames on top of his head. And normally that's the way he looks. At his time in Morrowind, he's become so diminished that he cannot maintain the flames. But it is a symbolic piece of... That those are his thoughts. They are burning and live like fire is. But yes, and then the people of the moon then argue that Nerevar hasn't really got what Vivek means because he's just killing people on the moon. And yes, they are a problem, but it's still, you know, their own thing going on. I am an atlas of... Sorry, Sermon 17. I am an atlas of smoke. With this, Vivek become greater than he had been. These were the days of Resdania, when Chimer and Dwemer lived under the wise and benevolent rule of the Almsivi and their champion, the Hortator. Seek me without effort, for I take many shapes. The Hortator was still trying to subdue the heavens with an axe. He was thrown out of the Library of the Sun by the power of Magnus. Vivek found him in a grub field outside of the swamps through the Deshen Plain. They walked for a span in silence, for Nerevar had been humbled, and Vivek still had mercy in his hands. Yeah, yeah. Soon they were walking across the eastern sea to the lands of snakes and snow demons. Vivek wanted to show the Hortator the fighting styles of the foreign tongues. They learned the idiom stroke from the pillow book of the Saki King. It is shaped like the inside of this page. The Saski serpents vowed to have their vengeance on the west at least three times. They walked farther and saw the spiked waters on the edge of the map. Here the limitation gift the spirit of limitation gifted them with a spoke and bade them find the rest of the wheel. The Hortator said, The edge of the world is made of swords. Vivek corrected him. They are the bottom row of the world's teeth. They walked to the north to the Elder Wood, and found nothing but frozen bearded kings. They came to the west where the black men dwelt. For a year they studied under their sword saints, and then for another, 
Vivek taught them the virtue of the little reward. Vivek chose a king for a wife and made another race of monsters which ended up destroying the West completely. To a warrior chief, Vivek said, we must not act and speak as if asleep. Nerevar wondered if there was anything to learn in the south, but Vivek remained silent and only led, read, led them back to Red Mountain. Here, Vivek said, is the last of the last. Within it, the Charmat waits. But they both knew that time was not ready to contest the Charmat, and so they engaged in combat with each other. Vivek marked the Hortator in this way for all of the Velothi to see. He sealed the wound, but with the blessing of Ayamazura, at the end of the battle, the Hortador found that he had gathered seven more spokes. He attempted to attach them and form a staff, but Vivek would not let him, saying, It is not the time for that. Nerevar said, Where did I find these? Vivek said that they had collected them from around the world, though some had come invisibly. I am the wheel, he said, and took that shape. Before the emptiness at the center could live too long, Nerevar put in the spokes. The ending of the words is Omsivi. Nerevar is still trying to fight all of the gods. Magnus is one of the mythopoeic forces that created the universe along with uh, Anu, I believe. And the sun, the large ball of gas, is not actually that in this universe. The sun is a hole ripped in the fabric of space when Magnus left the universe. He did not agree with the way that the universe was being built and founded, and so bodily, physically left it. And in doing so, ripped a hole in the fabric of space. And that hole is the sun. The light that comes through is sunlight. All of Magnus's attendants left as well, and they made much smaller holes, much further away, but those are all of the stars. And that's why stars are not as big as the sun. Nerevar appears to be traveling between all of the things in the sky and trying to fight them. And he'd been kicked out of the sun by Magnus. The land of snakes and snow demons is Akavir, which I believe is the origin of Redguards. It's both the... It's both the equivalent of... Japan and the continent of Africa. But yes, the people of Akavir swear vengeance on the West at least three times. There has been a couple of wars between Akavir and Tamriel. Um, they came to the West where the black men dwelt. Yokuda is the ancestral home of the Red Guards. What the hell is Akavir, then. Sorry, I just got a little confused. But yes, Akavir appears to have very little in the ways of, like, people, but they do have very Japanese-inspired armor, and it's the origin of the katana. Yokuda, however, is the origin of the Red Guards. And it also has some Japanese influences, um, and also from the continent of Africa. Things all over the place. Um, this is what they mean by the land of the black men. They literally mean people with dark skin. They mean black people. Um, for a year they studied under their sword saints. Uh, sword saint is a term from Yokuda, and it refers to the very, very strong swordsmen there. The actual term is Ansei. That just means sword saint, though. And the people in question are strong enough that normal mortals who know these sword techniques can fight gods. Um, Vivek chose a king for a wife. This appears to be the case. Vivek may have just had sex with one of their kings. Nerevar wonders if there's anything to learn in the south, but there is almost no lore from the south. They walk to the north to the Elderwood. This is a reference to Atmora. Atmora is the home of the Atmorans, naturally, 
who later came south and became the Nords. But this is why Atmora is nothing but frozen bearded kings. Because Atmora was getting too cold because of climate change. And became unlivable. And so the Atmorans went south and became Nords. Finding spokes is very unclear. But it appears to be that they're on an actual fetch quest, finding all of these spokes. Um, now, of our attempts to put them all together end to end to end, but that isn't how you're supposed to put a spoke in a wagon wheel. They go around the radius, they go in a circle around the middle, and hold the axle. Vivek then transforms into a wheel. As to how he does this, I'm not entirely sure. And before the wheel is empty for too long, Nerevar put all of the spokes in. This may be a reference to the Christian Bible. Um, some angels are, you know, the classical depictions of angels. Winged humans. Beautiful winged humans. Usually with robes. However, there are some very strange ones, like a giant chair or a halo of light. And one of them is just a spiked wheel with an eye in the center. Um, so, you know. It's just a bunch of, you know, pictures of wheels. That's what uh, angels are for a lot of people. Sermon 18. Now Vivek felt he had taught the Hortators much as he could before the war with the Dwemer came. The warrior poet decided he had to begin his book of hours at that point, because the world was about to bend with age. Vivek entered the morning hold and announced to Iam he was going to fight nine monsters that had escaped the Muatra. I will return, he said, to deal the last blow to the grand architect of the Dwemer. Iam said, out of nine you will find only eight, though they be mighty. The last is already destroyed by your decision to create the book of hours. Vivek understood that I am meant himself. Why, she asked, are you in doubt? Vivek knew that his doubt made him a sword of the triune, and so he did not feel shame or fear. Instead, he ex explained, and these are the words. Can a member of the Invisible Gate become so archaic its successor is not so much an improvement of the exact model, but rather a related model that is just needed more because of the currency of the world's condition? As the mother, you do not have to worry unless things in the future are so strange even Set cannot understand. Neither does the executioner the fool, but I am neither. These ideals are not going to change in nature, even though they may change in representation. But even in the West, the Rainmaker vanishes. No one needs them anymore. Can one oust the model, not because the model is set according to an ideal, but because it is tied to an ever-changing unconscious moral agenda? This is what was said to I am when Vivek was whole. The wise shall not mistake this. I am said, this is why you were born of a Netman's wife and destined to merge with a simulacrum of your mother, gilded and blended in all of the arts of the star-wounded east, under water and in fire and in metal and in ash, six times the wise, to become the union of male and female, the magic hermaphrodite, the martial axum, the sex hyphen death of language, and unique in all of the middle world. Vivek knew why he would record his book of hours. This sermon is forbidden. In this world and others, 18 less 1, the victor, is the magical disc, hurled to reach heaven by violence. This sermon is untrue. The ending of the world, it's alms city. So this is not the ending of the words, as in the things in a book. This is the ending of the word, world, you know, the planet we're on, is alms city. This one is particularly confusing, and considering the nature of this, that's rather saying something. Vivek is writing a new book. As to what the book of ours is, I'm not entirely sure. He was going... Vivek is going to go hunt down nine things that created... He may or may not have created and kill them. Um, Alexia tells him that he's only going to find eight. And they're strong, but he's missing the ninth. Because the ninth may or may not be doubt or a lack of creativity. And that's why it's destroyed by his decision to create the Book of Hours. The ninth may also be Vivek himself. As to why Vivek was on his own hit list is unclear. 
Can a member of the Invisible Brigade become so archaic its successor is not an improvement, but a related model needed more because of the currency of the world's condition? Um, one could argue that this is about the Nereverine. The Nereverine and Nerevar are not improvements, but merely one more finely tuned. The Invisible Gate, however, is a term for the Tribunal, and the Tribunal have all remade themselves. Vavek was born Vek, a mortal. You know, still an elf, a chimer, but not a god with divine power. Sothisil was born Set, and Amalexi was born I Am. None of them had divine power, and they all gave it to themselves. In West, the Rainmaker vanishes. The Rainmaker is a term for Shezar, and Shezar is just their name, is Cyrodiil's name for Lorcan or Shore. Six times the wise is referenced to Sermon 8. And as for what he means by this sermon is forbidden and untrue, I do not understand. This one is especially confusing for a lot of reasons. Sermon 19. Vivek put on his armor and stepped into a non-spatial space, filling to capacity with mortal intention and information, a canvasless cartography of every single mind it has ever known, an event that had developed some semblance of a divine spark. He said, from here I shall launch my attack on the eight monsters. Vivek then saw the moths that would come from the starry heart, bringing with them dust more horrible than the ash of the Red Mountain. He saw the twin head of a ruling king who had no equivalent, and eight imperfections rubbed into precious stones, set into a crown that looked like shackles, which he understood to be the twin crowns of the two-headed king, and a river that fed into the mouth of the two-headed king because he contained multitudes. Vivek then built a provisional house at the center of the secret door. From here he could watch the age to come. Of the houses written, cornerstone, one has a finger, buried under, pointed through, Dirt, slow, low in the ground. North cannot be guessed, and it is spirit three. Cornerstone two is a tongue, and even dust can be talkative. Listen, and you will see the love the ancient li libraries need. Cornerstone three is a bit of string, shaped like your favorite color. A girl remembers who left it there, but she is afraid to dig it out and see what it's attached to. Cornerstone four has nine bones, removed carefully from a black hat, arranged in the fashion of this word, protecting us from our enemies. Your house is safe now, so why is it... Your house is safe now, so why is it... The ending of the words is Almsivy. Vivek wearing armor is mentioned very few times. Most cases, he's actually completely nude or wearing a simple loincloth or maybe a mantle. He steps into a non-spatial space. He goes into what appears to be a place between reality um, and maybe the realm of thought, almost like in Gnosticism. Um, from here is where he intends to fight the monsters. The Moths is a reference to the Imperial Legion, and the Starry Heart is Cyrodiil bring with them dust more horrible than the ash of Red Mountain. Eight imperfections rubbed into precious stones are reference to the eight divines. Because Vivek likes throwing shade like that. He's basically saying that the eight are shit. This may also be what was meant by you will only find nine. If we assume that the eight monsters are the eight divines, then the former ninth divine, Lorcan slash Shor slash Shezar, is dead. He's been killed. This is why you cannot find him and why his heart is able to be found in the middle of Red Mountain. He was ripped out of his body. The moons, again, also ripped out of his body. There's some of his organs floating above the planet. Um, the Imperial Legion, obviously, they're an empire. They have an emperor. The emperor is very religious. They worship the divines. Um, 
But what's more, considering Talos was an emperor, he was Tiber Septim, and he became a god, he became Talos, the new ninth divine, this may also be why Vivek would not be able to find the ninth divine. He does not exist yet. The age to come is just the third era, where most of the games take place. Skyrim is in the fourth, um, but only just after the 4th has started, only about 200 years in. Sermon 20. The first monster was actually two, having been born twice like his mother hyphen father Vivek. He was not the mightiest of the eight to escape Muatra, but his actions were most worrisome. He was known as Moon Axel and he harvested the leftover foibles of nature. This he did twice, as was said, and the second harvest always brought ruin or unwritten law. His aspect was faceted like a polyhedron. No perils are mentioned in the finding of Moon Axel, but it is known that he was immune to spears, so Vivek had to use the sword not held against him. Before he took issue with the monster, the warrior poet asked, How did you came to be immune to spears? To which the Moon Axel replied, Mine is a dual nature and protein. I am, in fact, made of many straight lines, though none last too long. In this way, I have learned to ignore all true segments. Luckily, the sword not held was curved, and therefore could cut into Moon Axel. And before the sun was up, he was bleeding from many wounds. Vivek did not slay him outright, for to do so would to keep the foibles of nature within him, and not back where they belong. Soon, Vivek had traced geography right again, and Moon Axel was ready to be slain. Vivek rose up in his giant form to be terrible to look upon. He reached into the west and pulled out a cannon, holding it like a horn. He reached east and ate a handful of Nyx hounds. Blowing their spirits through the canyon made a terrible wail, not unlike an unsolved woman. He said, Let this overtake you. And Moon Axel was overtaken by the curvatures of stolen souls. They wrapped around the monster like resin until he finally could not move, nor could his dual nature. Vivek said, Now you are solved and pierced his child with Muatra. Moon Axel had been reduced to something static and therefore shattered. The lines of Moon Axel were collected by Velothi philosophers and taken into caves. There, and for a year, Vivek taught the philosophers how to turn the lines of his son into the spokes of mystery wheels. This was the birth of the first whirling school, before there had only been the surface thought of fire. Vivek looked at his thirst wheeling students and observed, Alike the egg-layered universe is this morbid possession of three distant coverage, soul reckoned and alive, like my name is alive. In this cloister you have discovered one walking path, hilled like a sword more coarsened, so edged it is that it has to be whispered to keep the tongue from bleeding, where its signs evacuate their former meanings, like empires that tarry too long. The sword is estrangement from statementship. Look upon the estimable lines of my son, now crafted star-wise, his every limb equidistant from the center. Is he solved because I will it so? There cannot be a second stage. Think on the theory that my existence promulgates the five elements and alike the egg-layered universe. I am cause for great density. Here's a thought that can break the wagon's axle. Here's another that can soar. The ending of the words is almost city. The first monster is named Moon Axle, and it's a binary creature much like Vivek. Um, he's not strong, but he has the ability to rewrite reality. This may or may not be because he exists in the liminal space between reality, much like Vivek himself does currently. But this is because Vivek has stepped into it, whereas Moon Axel is there by his nature. Um, Moon Axel is a being of pure geometry and so cannot be attacked with straight lines. Anything that is a straight line is something that will not work on him because he is made of straight lines. This appears to be legitimate because he exists in a space of pure minds. It's not really clear how that works, but just roll with it. And so Vivek has to use a curved sword. Scimitars are found here and there among the Dunmer, um, usually as an important ceremonial sword. This may be the case why, because there's something great Vivek used once, and so that's why. Alternatively, they may have already been a gift, and this is why Vivek wrote that he used one, because it will legitimize this. Vivek beats the shit out of him, but does not kill him yet, because of the reality-warping nature of Moon Axel. Reality will not go back to the way it's supposed to be. 
Vivek pulls a canyon and a bunch of Nyx hounds. As to how he grabs a canyon is unclear, but he may grab the wind from it and shape it using magic. The Nyx hounds he eats and then uses their spirits. Considering that soul trapping and enchantment is very, very common in Morrowind, this makes a lot of sense. Another thing about Moon Axel is that he must be constantly moving because of just how he is, I think. The stolen souls wrap around him like resin. Vivek may just be using these souls to paralyze him, you know, like an enchantment, like a jinx sword. Um, they mentioned that they wrap around him like resin. Resin is something that's very common in Morrowind. It's what makes Chitin able to be turned into armor. Chitin plates pulled from the backs of beasts are mixed with resin and then turned into clothing. And bones are not found in that form. There are some helmets, like a Nordic Trollbone helm, that are just the bone of a monster with enough room carved out for somebody's head. But that's not the case for bone mold armor. Naturally, the mold part of it is the active word here. The bone mold part is because they grind the bone into powder. This is why bone dust is a component in crafting it in every game that you can craft it. But when they grind it into powder, they then mix it with resin. The two activate one another and it becomes very strong. This is why bone mold armor is considered as strong as steel. Even though steel is a really good metal and bones are just calcium deposits. The resin is the active ingredient here. This is probably why Favek uses the term resin, because it's very recognizable for the people of Morrowind, as armor is worn by a lot of people. Again, this is another piece of symbolism of wheels. The lines that Moon Axel is made of are turned into the spokes in a wagon wheel. Um... Again, it is very confusing as to how that actually works, but you know what? I'll roll with it. The thing that Moon Axel says is, mine is a dual nature and protein. He's not saying protein. He's saying the word protein. P-R-O-T-E-A-N. And it comes from Proteus, an old Greek god. It's one of those things where like they're a strong spirit, but they're not really a god. But the word God is a bit occluded in Greek mythology. Because sometimes when people say God, they mean Olympian, of which there are only 12. Or they mean Olympian and Titans and the gods that came before the Titans. Um, but there are gods that are not primordial gods, Titans, or Olympians. And I believe Proteus is one of those. Proteus was a water spirit and was able to change his form very easily. And so protein today means ever-changing or very easy to change. Um, and again, this is where Moon Axel explains he's made of many straight lines. Harvesting the leftover foibles of nature is just a very confusing way to write that he fucked with maps. Um... He made the land and the world not conform to maps. As to how, is because he's a reality warping deity, much like his father. Well, father hyphen mother. Um. The pleasure is all. Mine. I'm just looking at anything else that I can get from here. I think that's good. I said that I would read the next 12, but I'm going to skip out on the next four and only read to Sermon 20 because I have gone for an hour. Um, I am a little hoarse, but I can still read. I just want to make sure that this video doesn't run too long. I also wish to inform you there will be a slight break until the next episode of Morrowind. I believe because off is ending. Um... And because uh, soon, 
new things will be starting. It won't be a long break, no more than a week, um, but I have a couple of things to upload. Let it be clarified, I am not going to abandon Morrowind. I have abandoned a few LPs. I do intend to go back to some of them, but Morrowind will return. But yes, I have been Alfred. These have been 36 lessons of Vivek. 13 through 20. Uh, I will see you guys next time. Thank you for coming by. Have a good day.